Hi again, welcome back to Friday Live. I'm Cara Barrett, editor at Hodinkee, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Edward, Eric Wendt, <laughs> <laughs> senior watch specialist at Christie's, um, and an old friend of Hodinkee and former contributor. So yes. welcome. Thank you for having me, Cara. It's a pleasure. Thank it's you a for dream come true, and hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, <thank you. laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about watches and icons, and earlier this week we, I published a story on Jackie O's watch that's coming up for sale at the Christie's auction um, on the 21st, and today we have it in the office. So let's talk about it a little bit. Um, what the are your thoughts on it? Yeah, so the watch is manufactured uh, circa 1962. Um, it's a very exciting watch, of course, when I got the email that the uh, owner may be interested in selling it earlier this year. I couldn't believe it in my eyes. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a moment of elation, which is very exciting. The, uh, the watch is preserved in very original condition with the original dial, which is amazing. She wore it throughout her life from when she got it in 1963 until she passed. Um, interestingly enough, you know, it was not part of the famous Jackie Kennedy auction at Sotheby's mm. in 1995. No one really knew where it went all this time. Um, so we were, we presumed it was still within the family. Um, and the watch is very interesting because one, it's one of the most iconic Cartier watches yeah. ever. Um, I, I think that doing rough math, it probably has led to over a billion dollars in sales for Cartier, uh, particularly among women's watches. Yeah. And particularly in New York, when you walk around, every uh, woman is wearing a tank just about on Wall Street and other places. Yeah, it's a popular model for sure. It actually was my first watch when I was 18. I got the uh, steel tank That's awesome. um, with the bracelet. It was unfortunately... Yeah stolen from me, no. alas, um, oh, no. but we move on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so for me, I agree, it's one of the most iconic watches that Cartier's yeah. ever produced and still produces. It's actually the 100th anniversary this year of the Cartier yeah. 10. So it's amazing. It, did you guys know, did you hear about this last year and then plan it with the no, 100th anniversary? No, we heard or? it earlier, a few months ago. Interesting, and, uh, super cool. Yeah, and then the amazing thing is also the occasion it was given to her by her brother-in-law, and it includes a painting that she gave her brother-in-law. Right, yeah, uh, the painting's is really sweet. Really um, beautiful, yeah. You can see a picture of it on the article if you want to take a look at it. Yeah. I actually, when I saw it, I was like, oh, this would look great in my kitchen. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just exactly. like such a nice little artifact yeah. that comes, go, accompanies the and watch. funny um, tidbit about that, of course, we got a lot of press when we announced this in Town & Country and other publications. Of course, Hodinkee was the first uh, to go live with the story. Uh, but uh, one Irish newspaper published that a Jackie Kennedy painting is coming to auction and wrote a whole article about oh, that. Oh, amazing. And then at the end they said, oh, and it also includes a Cartier watch. Yeah. <laughs> Usually the story was reversed, so that was pretty yeah. funny. Uh, yeah, so we're excited about it. Yeah, and it's, I feel like there's so many iconic watches that are coming up for sale. We have the Paul, Paul Newman's Paul Newman. Yeah. We talked about it to death. Yeah. Um, still really excited about it. And yeah. then I feel you have a couple other watches here yes. with you today that belong of, to icons or, yeah. or were inspired by icons. Exactly. So if you want to. So one of the fun things about you know working in an auction house is that you can, as you get property, begin to think about thematic auctions or thematic sections. So we ended up getting a couple interesting pieces of, from different American icons. And then um, I. Create, created this idea of giving that as the subtitle of the yeah. auction, and then we were able to go out and source more property from collectors. And yeah. um, so, you know, we we have a. I'm a big fan of presidential watches. Yeah. Actually, Christie's has never sold a presidential owned and worn watch uh, before, and many other auction houses have. Um, so that was something I've been focused on since I joined Christie's. Yeah. Since that's my bread and butter. So when the opportunity came to have uh, yeah, the so we LBG. Yeah. Start with that one. Yeah, the LBJ Hamilton um, in two tone. Uh, it was a gift from the McDowell County Democrats, and he wore it throughout the 1960 campaign as vice president to President Kennedy. Um, it's a, an electric watch, uh, which is amazing. It's running and was serviced. <laughs> yeah, it's um, incredible. Many of these have service issues, so that's quite cool. You can see the way it sort of sweeps gradually um, and was the predecessor to the quartz watch. Um, the condition's beautiful. Um, it's got a, an inscription on the back. That's very cool. And it's possible he wore that um, in the 1960 campaign because it was American, because it was sort of avant-garde, yeah. and he had Patek Philippe watches at that time, uh, but this may be connected more with voters, perhaps like Bill Clinton wearing the Timex Iron Man and right. other, other politicians of the last uh, and 30 years. Elvis also had 
He had the Ventura, which yeah, was very similar. It's a similar so one. I think this is the second most important Hamilton ever, uh, the Ventura that Elvis wore in Blue Crush is probably the most uh, important. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what, can you tell everyone what the difference between the, an electric watch and a quartz watch is? Because I know there's, yeah. sometimes I get a yeah, little confused, are, and so I feel yeah. like so it the, might be good um, too. I, I think the Accutron was the first electric, and uh, they're battery powered, but the mechanism's very different. They're not nearly as accurate, and the battery, the reserves are far less uh, than the quartz watches that followed with the yeah. Seiko um, uh, Astron in 1969. But this was sort of the start of having a, a battery powered watch on the wrist. Yeah. yeah, it's a super cool watch. And so there's also another LBJ watch that we have here or LBJ yeah. related. Yeah, I guess. exactly. Yeah, so um, I first covered this in the Hodinkee Presidential yeah. Guide. More on that yeah. in a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> and we uh, sort of cataloged no one, interestingly enough, until that came out and I began talking to more people and researching it, a lot of people thought these were Masonic watches. Mm. There were some traced to LBJ, and um, I think that the case can certainly be made, and I think is made, that all of these were ordered by LBJ originally. Yeah. This was his favorite motto, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. <laughs> exactly. So that uh, that watch, he ordered both 2552s, which right. is this sort of disco volante, as some people call it, case, uh, and with a beautiful automatic movement, Cardi, uh, sorry, Patek Philippe's first, mm -hmm. uh, and the 2526 with enamel dial and some had metal dials, um, which is also an automatic watch, the first reference from Paddock to yeah. have an automatic movement. And he also did this on another Hamilton as well. Yes, yeah, um, and an electric Hamilton. Do you know where did, that one is? That was sold at auction at Heritage um, for something very cheap, under $1,000. And is there and only I, one, or are there multiple the of the That's the only one known, and it has an LBJ on it. And it I only sold for 1000 It was under, it was like 800 Oh, boy. And I really regret not buying that. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, these are uh, incredibly cool watches um, and the dials were likely placed on them in in New York I think at Tiffany some mm -hmm. of them say Tiffany and some of them don't so maybe some were placed in at a Texas retailer but uh, they uh, they were placed in the US on the watches and uh, paddock extracts um, generally say they don't have record of the style right so it's a very interesting story yeah I think they're really cool unique watches. and there are only ten about 10 now. That have come up? Yeah, okay. exactly. Across both references. Yeah, I think, and this one was was given to, this was his. He gave it to uh, He gave it someone. to someone, okay. Yeah. And then yeah. his, he used to wear it as well, or no? He, he has two that are in the museum, both okay. two five two sixes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So he That's wore the 2526 cool. and then yeah. this is the 2522. Yeah. Okay. 2552. Five, two. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Love the reference numbers. Um, but yeah, so that one's really great. And then, I like this one a lot. The Cartier $20 coin watch. Yeah, so this is was made in 1926. Uh, in the catalog, we have a photo of the register showing it, mm. this number being a coin watch in uh, 1926. Love those yeah, so um, it's a 1908 $20 coin. It's quite worn, um, but this design was from Augustus St. Gaudens, and uh, he's it's considered by many to be the most beautiful American coin ever made. Um, it, uh, it's very rare to find any coin watch from the 1920s. Yeah, this was the, it's really were, early, because the usually they had them in like the 50s, 60s. 30s, 40s, 50s, yeah. 60s, yeah. yeah. So only a few known of any brand in the 20s. Um, this was like definitely very cutting edge and seen as very cool because you can have this in your pocket and no one would know that it was actually a watch. Right. Um, so that was sort of the, the appeal of this. And, um, he, he supposedly, this was his personal piece for 11 years. Okay. And he and gave it to a uh, legendary gangster, Bumpy Johnson. Bumpy. We've been talking about Bumpy. <laughs> yeah. It's in 1937. Will wants to be called Bumpy from yes, now on. That's yeah. what he told me earlier. Yeah, so good. it's a new nickname good. in the office for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so Bumpy owned uh, this and he also wore it. So the watch, uh, you know, the features are quite worn just yeah. because you're having it in your hand and having it in your pocket. Uh, and, um, he, he had it uh, for many years and wore it and of course proudly showed it as a trophy yeah. that the babe gave it to him. The exact relationship between the two of them isn't known. 
Maybe there was some gambling. Maybe there was some other stuff He was a troublemaker. I don't know much about Babe Ruth or sports for that matter, but I did read that he was a troublemaker. He was. So I feel like maybe that. He lived the good life, and uh, I think that... (laughs) His best life. Yeah. (laughs) I think that there's an interesting story. I wish we knew the exact specifics about how Bumpy knew Babe, but it's very, very cool. Yeah, it's cool to see things like this come up in auction, and I think... Yeah so much about collecting watches and buying watches and loving watches is the story behind them and so when there's someone like Babe Ruth or LBJ kind of tied into them it just really like I don't know when the Cartier tank first came in it was just like magic and I don't know it's something that you really can't duplicate so and these are on display this weekend so yeah at Rockefeller Plaza Christie's if you're um, in New York you can today through Tuesday you can hold Babe Ruth's coin watch yeah and coin watches generally interestingly enough have I've seen a lot more interest in them the yeah. last two years from younger people that are getting into it and uh, collectors that just think they're very cool to have on their yeah. desk. Or you touch them and you can see it took so many hours to produce something like this and cut it apart so carefully. It's, yeah. uh, it's craftsmanship unlike anything we see today, yeah. basically. And then other makers that made them, but Piaget made them, and then... Patek Philippe, yeah. um, we see Rolex, a number of brands. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't think I've ever seen a Rolex one. Yeah, we had one in Geneva, and there's a few out there. Oh, God, I'll have yeah. to take a look. Yeah. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Um, and then, so, speaking of presidents, yeah. I don't know if you guys have read it yet, but you should, because Eric wrote a very long and in-depth article on presidents' watches. Um, and so I kind of wanted, while you're here, I wanted to ask you what your favorite president's watch is. And it was around the time I was first getting into watches, I heard the story about, it, which was an international news story about Abraham Lincoln's pocket watch at the Smithsonian mm. American History Museum in DC, and that they were going to have this opening of the watch to examine the movement. Right. And, uh, it was, like a, it was like a ceremony to open yeah, the watch. Yeah, and see what happened, because the watchmaker was working on it at the outbreak of the Civil War in mm-hmm. 1861, and it passed down in his family for 140 years oh, wow. that their ancestor had worked on Abraham Lincoln's watch and written something yeah. on the movement. On the, <laughs> so, That's incredible, so, yeah. And then Abraham Lincoln himself apparently didn't know that this engraving was on so the So he watch. dropped it off for service. Uh, yes, and then the, and then the Civil guy, War broke out. The Civil War out, broke out. The guy wrote, wrote an inscription, yeah. yes. put it back together, yep. and then gave it back to Lincoln? Yeah. And, okay. and the president never knew. I would be kind of go. pissed if watchmakers were writing stuff yeah. on my movements. Are you going to open up all your watches? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anything no, secret? hopefully not. <laughs> and so uh, they they had this big ceremony, all kinds of press there, and they opened it up, and the message is there, and it was yeah. like so formal and staged. It was funny to see the watchmaker looking at the it's loop. So and cool. The whole deal was amazing. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of when I was first getting interested in watches, and why I've always had this interest in presidential watches. Yeah. And um, so I. For me, what I I was rereading the article, and I I guess I never was I had never been so struck. But I think LBJ has the best taste in watches, and I didn't realize that he was he really focused on the craft of collecting, and yeah. he really enjoyed watches. He did. And um, there's a cool story about the Vulcan cricket, yeah. which he loved. He liked alarm watches a lot. It yeah. seemed, and uh, he loved gifts. So that hence why we see this uh, reference. Uh, 2552. Um, he loved to give very extravagant gifts to friends and fellow members of the Senate. So it was good to be pals with uh, LBJ. Yeah. Okay. So he had his staff go out when they were in Geneva and buy uh, every single Volcano Cricket they could get their hands on so he could give them as gifts. Um, and there's at least one in the National yeah. Watch and Clock Museum that has the LBJ on it, on the dial. Very cool. And is that where, so I know Obama was gifted a Vulcan. Yeah, so is that the, where that kind of yeah, tradition came from? Yeah, the or? first was Truman got one from okay. the White House press uh, photographers, a press corps, and they uh, then helped Eisenhower had one that apparently the alarm went off during a meeting um, about tariffs on Swiss watches to right. protect the American watchmaking industry. So it was very <laughs> ironic that a Swiss watch was ringing, and you know he looked a little foolish at the yeah. time, and uh, and then. Every president except um, President Bush has been given one uh, by, particularly this gentleman in Finland who's a watch retailer, oh, okay. uh, has been giving them. So he. Oh, so it's an individual that gives them? Yeah. It's not the company? It, the company and the individual okay. separately okay. Uh, or in conjunction uh, in a few cases. Very so, cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, that's a great, uh, yeah, I love that story. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I think we'll move on to what's on our wrists next. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
politics aside and move <laughs> on from that. Um, but yeah, I, what are you wearing today? I am wearing an early 1940s Hoyer um, on a gay frere bracelet. Uh, got it on eBay, of all places. But I'm oh, wearing- Oh, an eBay find. Yeah, and uh, very scratched up crystal. It's an amazing watch. We have a group of over 30 Hoyer chronographs in our auction on Wednesday. Oh, okay, great. So a lot of Hoyer collectors are coming from around yeah, the country. Big, so they're having a moment, to, I would say. Yeah, so I've yeah. got to wear a Hoyer to represent my people. Oh, of course. Well, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm wearing my Daytona, the yeah. Cerachrome bezel that I got last year after Basel, my first Basel. So it's a great summer watch. I just love wearing it. Um, you can beat it around. I mean, it's over a year old, and it's barely... It looks great. looks brand new. Yeah. So I'm really into it. And I do get a lot of messages about whether why I chose the black or if I prefer the yeah. white. Yeah. I chose the black. It just suited my, truth be told, my outfits more. Yeah. Um, as shallow as that sounds. Yes. Uh, but that was just kind of it for me. So, That's great. But I do like the white as well. Yeah. Um, either one. Um, so I think we're going to move on to questions. And we had some questions that were submitted last week. And so we're going to go back and revisit those. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, sounds good. So someone asked, uh, A White 12, uh, why, if we prefer buying vintage or buying modern and what our opinions are on that and how you decide. And so since you are you know, a vintage ex expert, I mean, what are your thoughts on vintage versus I think modern? I like the, vin the stories behind vintage watches, the way they were made without computers. You can tell just the hand craftsmanship that was required in making the cases and the movements and the dials. Mm -hmm. uh, I, of course, love new watches, certainly uh, ones that have a lot of vintage inspiration, classic inspiration. Um, and I mean, with most new watches, it's sort of like going and buying a new car where there'll be depreciation. Yeah. So we always tell people to be sensitive about that because if you're going in and buying a new BMW M3 right. in five years, it's going to be worth yeah. a lot less. Um, yeah. And people come to us with these big collections, sometimes multi-million dollar collections. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you saw the same at Sotheby's. And they <laughs> think that these <laughs> things will be worth 90% of what they paid. And yeah. it's a fraction. There's That was always a bummer. It is, yeah. Seller. So that's a hard part of the job. But uh, um, vintage watches, of course, if you buy them right, they're generally worth close to what you paid. Right. And um, hopefully, you know, as more people get into them, we've seen, obviously, rapid increases yeah. in price. What modern watch did you what did you like from the releases this year the most that was modern like what was your um, favorite i like the octavia although okay. it's a little bit thick for me and i would prefer it without date okay um, but i like that watch and i like the they did a, the bracelet very well executed right. i thought yeah. was that's to me one of the most amazing things that was my favorite thing about yeah it. I love um, it. and uh what about you my favorite Gosh, now I'm drawing a blank. Um, what did I like? I liked the, well, I was just gonna say the Yacht Master from Rolex, yeah. all those multicolored yeah. stones, but I know that everybody hates so that watch. Um, yeah, no, it's I amazing. Think, I think that watch is gonna be worth a lot of money. The thing about uh, that watch is like, it's, it's so crazy, but when you understand the craftsmanship that goes behind getting yeah. all those stones together, yeah. it's really just, yeah, I don't know. And like, you have to respect the I mean. rainbow watches, both white gold and yellow gold from the white gold rainbow Daytona and the yeah. yellow gold. Those are watches that are worth so much more than they were originally. Yeah. Uh, I also like the pink gold Daytona that they came out with the Cerakote yes, bezel, yeah, but yeah. I want it on a bracelet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I feel like that's kind of yeah. how it looks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, and then the next question was, um, Son of Alanga is... I love that username, by the way. <laughs> I hope you can help me out with on this one. I want to buy a watch for under 2K. I'm thinking of a Nomos Tangenta or a club. However, I'd like to know if there's some great iconic vintage pieces that one can get for under 2K. Yeah, so on the vintage front, I feel like Volcane Crickets are very, mm -hmm. they can be 600 to $1,000 on eBay or less. Um, they're really great movements, very reliable, yeah. very well made. Uh, and sort of they're worth the same amount that they were when I started buying them seven years ago. They haven't moved very much. Uh, and then also Omega Seamasters from the 60s. Right. They're, you know, 35 millimeters or around there. They've got these nice straight lugs. It's like uh, Don, uh, Don Draper um, and Mad Men mm -hmm. or one with a black dial, just that sort of case. Yeah. Um, and very easy watches to wear that look great. And obviously a great brand name, very good movements. Um, yeah. They're like $500 to $1,000 in yeah. that range. 
I like the um, Wittenauer chronographs with the Valjoux 72 movements. I think those are just really well designed and the movement is you know, it's the same as a Daytona. So yeah. it's, you kind of get a lot of bang for your buck. And then as far as the modern, I think your suggestion of the club is a great option. Um, for me, I loved the pink one that came out this yeah. year. Yeah. Um, but then, And then the Max Bill watches from Youngins I yeah. think are great for what they, they're, I've got two vintage models. I like, they're basically the same, except a little bigger than new ones. You can get the same original size too, and they're around a thousand. I've recommended them to a lot of friends over the last yeah. few years who are looking for something in that range that they can wear, and they've been all thrilled with them. Yeah, oh great, good to know. Um, so now we're gonna move to some live questions that are going on. And, hold on one second, just gonna. Oh, Ricardo Reese one wants to know, one presidential watch I found super interesting was Winston's Tr Winston Churchill's Lamania chronograph. What's the story there? Well, he wasn't a president, but we can talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> True. <Yeah>. Prime uh, Minister. <laughs> uh, that was an amazing watch. Um, it's one of those watches like, like a lot of provenance watches mm -hmm. where the provenance is over 90% of the value. Right. And it sold at uh, Sotheby's London for almost 200,000. Yeah, I remember, yeah. Uh, a few months ago, amazing watch. I'm not sure if he actually wore it, um, but uh, it was mint condition and it was a gift to him. Uh, so very cool watch. Amazing. Um, and then next. <laughs> Winston Churchill uh, had a Rolex that he wore frequently, which Rolex gave to him. Um, it was, I think, the, the 500,000th chronometer they made, and it was in gold. And he also had a Breguet pocket watch he wore frequently. Both are on display in London. Yeah. Um, and very cool to see. Awesome. Um, a cool, smart person asked, what's it like working for someone as awesome as Ben? I think <laughs> Ben may have just submitted that question. <laughs> it's terrible. He's the worst. <laughs> just kidding. He's awesome. Just don't, don't be mad. He's crazy. Yeah. He's awesome. um, so we've seen a lot of association watches garnering attention re recently. Jackie Kennedy, Paul Newman, Babe Ruth. I wonder if Eric foresees this trend extending to less exalted or less monumental figures in history. What do, where do you draw the line? Nancy Reagan, Burt Reynolds, Jose Kansenko. Yeah, I think, I um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think um, all provenance is sort of interesting around watches, um, but there was a lot of excitement with um, Bernie Madoff and his watch oh, collection yeah. a few years back. I remember that's all everyone could talk about, his buying his watches from yeah. the government auction. And people were paying ridiculous figures for refinished dial, Rolex chronograph, vintage, and all these other pieces. They were spending over 30000 and the watch is worth that's like 10000 so That's so crazy, um, because for <laughs> me, like when someone, ha there's a negative yeah. connotation with the person. Yes. I feel like that would almost, it would hurt. Yes, yeah, it would yeah, hurt the, yeah. the value of the yeah. watch, but I guess I generally, not. I think those people have, most of the watches I remember looking at the time of the auction, yeah. thinking that what sort of junk, um, and people were irrationally exuberant thinking it would be some important historical figure, and I think they've lost money. People I was gonna say, th yeah, they'll come, yeah. come back up, and yeah. I'm sure they're not gonna make. I don't think, I think they, a lot, most of them lost yeah. money on that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do in a situation like that? So when you get a watch and the provenance isn't ideal, uh, it but it's depends. someone iconic. Yeah. It's like in a negative connotation. Do you convince yeah. the seller to not mention it's it? Really, you... Yeah, it's just case by case. Yeah. Um, we, of course, generally stay away from Nazi watches, um, right. and that's That's important. a general rule. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can't think of any other cases beyond yeah. that. That's the hard, would, there's, that's yeah. the one hard rule. Yeah. Okay, so Eric, curious to, hear, curious to hear your perspective on the significant delta between vintage UG and Hoyer, for example. Less or no brands with similar cases and identical movements such as Galley, Wittenau, or Zodiac at all. And what do you think the market may look like in the future? I think um, certainly Ben, uh, a lot of people attribute Ben to the rise in uh, Universal Genève interest over the last uh, seven years. Um, and he's got an amazing collection of those. Yeah. Um, Hoyer, we've seen absolutely skyrocket the last two and a half years. And uh, I think part of it was initially people that were looking for other brands but when they couldn't afford vintage Rolex Daytonas and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, part of it is definitely um, the amount of information that's out there because it's not like 
uh, really we have Jeff Stein to thank of on the dash. Without, I said if if we go back in history like Terminator style and kill Jeff Stein, I think Hoyer collecting would be so different. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the Hoyers would be like worse than Galets, maybe, I don't know. I mean, they're amazing watches, but people might not. It'd be like any car is what right. I compare it to. There's no sight. Uh, that really uh, explains all about any car watches in the same way. Yeah. Uh, but if there was, and I think people are working on it, I mean, Aquastar, for instance, mm -hmm. were great watches, and there was just the first ever Aquastar get together in Geneva oh, before the auction. And now we're seeing these prices go sometimes 5x what they were a yeah. year ago, two years ago. Um, so it's really driven by collectors, driven by knowledge, and other people thinking it's cool. More and more people are getting on the Galet bandwagon. Yeah, no, I, love, I love Galets. I love them. I have one. I've owned a few, and yeah. I think they're really undervalued compared to other brands. So the next big thing? Galet. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Cara. And thank you all for joining us. Um, and as always, if you leave your questions below, we'll try to answer them next week. And um, that's us signing Good. off. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.